Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar at Statistics Solutions. Today, we are going to discuss how to conduct and interpret ANOVAs, uh, probably one of the most common used analyses for statistics and dissertations specifically. Uh, my name is Justin D'Souza. I'm a quantitative specialist here at the company. We're going to go through the entire presentation first, and then we'll do a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so we'll look at some examples of ANOVAs and how to set them up and how to run them in SPSS. And uh, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll send everyone a copy of the webinar and the PowerPoint. All right, first I'll give an overview of the services we provide at Statistic Solutions, then we will look at conducting ANOVAs, um, and then we'll do a demonstration in SBSS, actually not Intellectus, but uh, in a future webinar, we can look at Intellectus as well. We'll look at SBSS today, and then we'll conclude with a summary and a Q&A session. On this slide, you can see all the different parts of the dissertation that we assist with. We have literature review specialists at our company, and we have both quantitative and qualitative specialists. Um, so depending on what chapter you're working on and if you need any assistance, uh, just let us know and we can help to expedite the process and help you address committee feedback, um, help to set up the paper in APA format, um, and basically help with any part of the dissertation if you need assistance. Um, so if you do need help, give us a call at 727-442-4290. All right, uh, what is an ANOVA? An ANOVA stands for an analysis of variance. So you can see where the acronym comes from, analysis, A-N, of is the O, and variance is the V-A. So this is used typically when you're assessing for differences. Uh, that is the key word here. We're looking for differences in a continuous variable between multiple groups. Okay, so if you're trying to look at relationships or correlations or prediction, ANOVA is probably not your best option. Uh, if you're doing prediction, then you should, you should probably run regressions. If you're looking at associations, or correlations, then most likely yeah. correlations, experiment correlations, or experiment correlations. If you're looking for differences, that pretty much narrows it down to t-tests and ANOVAs. Um, so if you have three or more groups that you're comparing, that's when you want to run ANOVAs. Okay, uh, so here to set up an ANOVA, you need to have an independent variable that has two or more discrete groups. Um, examples of this include comparisons between classes or comparisons between ethnicities. Um, if you had a treatment group, a treatment one, a treatment two, and the group, that is when you can do an ANOVA. Technically, it does say two plus discrete groups. You can run an ANOVA if you're only comparing two groups. However, it's a little redundant. Um, you might as well just run a t-test if you're comparing two groups, if you're comparing males and females. Um, usually an independent t-test is done. You don't need to run an ANOVA for something like that. But the math still does work. Um, so technically, you could run an ANOVA for just a male and female comparison. The second prerequisite is to have a continuous dependent variable. So essentially something that is numerically measurable. Um, that is the variable that you want to see differences in. And then you can check for the assumptions of an ANOVA. Um, so this is where you have to check with your committee. Most committees are going to have preferences for what assumptions to check. And we've done webinars on assumption checking. In fact, I did one last week. Uh, where we look at normality and homogeneity of variance and linearity. Uh, but you can check out this, uh, this statistics website at Statistics Layered. Um, and if you just type in analysis on Google, like ANOVA and Statistics Layered, this is the first web link that is going to pop up. So Statistics Layered goes 
quite detailed assumption by, this, by assumption what should be tested to run this analysis ideally. Uh, but verify with your committee if they have a preference for what assumptions to check, because while I do think statistics layered is great, I think they list too many assumptions. I, I wouldn't check all six of these things. And if you're running a multiple regression, uh, they list 10 plus assumptions that you can check, but not all of them are crucially important, I would say. Normality, these last two are quite important. So normality and homogeneity of variance. Okay, so if you joined us last week, you can take a look at the webinar last week where we looked at assumptions with a high level of detail. Um, so once you have your independent and dependent variables set up, you've checked your assumptions, then you can run the analysis in SPSF. Um, I have a sample data set here of three different classrooms. We have class A, we have class B, and we have class C. This is SPSS, by the way. Um, and then we have the gender of the students. And then we have a series of test scores. Uh, math and science were collected only once at the end of the school year, whereas reading was collected three times. Okay, It was collected at the pre-test at the beginning of the year. It was collected at the midpoint of the year. And then it was collected at the end of the year. So we have three different measurements for reading, and we have one for math and one for science. So a research question to set up an ANOVA would be something like, are there significant differences in test scores based on classroom? We have five continuous dependent variables here. These are all numeric. Uh, they fall on intervals, they have decimals as possibilities, these are all continuous. The independent variable would be your grouping factor, uh, which in this example would be class, class A, class B, class C. So the first thing you should do is check for normality. Okay, so we did go through this in depth last week. And this is how you check for normality. There are many ways to check for normality. You can do it visually with scatter plots or histograms, but you can also run tests of significance like a Shapiro Woke test or a Komogorov Smirnov test. Um, if normality is not supported, then you can shift to non parametric alternatives. Most statistical analyses have a non parametric backup that you can run. That is not so strict on assumptions. The normality is not a requirement, and we'll look at that as well. Uh, and if you have a really large sample size, you can apply the central limit theorem to proceed using parametric analyses, even if the assumption is not supported for normality. The central limit theorem, the idea behind that is the larger your sample, the more it tends to approximate towards a normal L-shaped curve. So 50 is kind of the number to shoot for there. If you're below 50, then you might have to proceed with a non-parametric alternative. Okay, so here we have our test scores. And if we want to check for normality, we will go to analyze and descriptive statistics and explore. And then we'll put in all our continuous dependent variables into this right box. Dependent list, we'll go to plots and check mark this option here, normality plots with test, and then click okay. And this analysis takes 10 to 15 seconds to run. It's quite a big one. All right, there we have it. Then what you want to look for is this table right here, tests of normality. Um, you can use either the Komogorov Smirnov test or you can use the Shapiro Wilk. Uh, verify with your committee if they have a preference for what method to use. I tend to go with Shapiro Wilk just because I see it being used more often. And we want to look at the significance column right here. And Significance for this test is actually not ideal. Uh, we want to see non-significance. 
So we want p values that are greater than 0 0.05 for this test, and we do see that. Okay, 0.958 for math, that is larger than 0 0.05. 0.626 is larger than 0 0.05, and all of the numbers here are not significant, which is good. Um, that means that your data resemble a bell-shaped curve. This had been significant. Hypothetically, if these were below 0 0.05, it would mean your data are significantly different than a perfect bell-shaped curve, which is not what we want. The so non-significance for both tests, meaning normality is supported. That's great. Uh, that gives us the ability to proceed and run the ANOVA. We will go to Analyze and General Linear Model and then Univariate. All right, then, you know, let's look at math on its own. Let's put math in the dependent box and assess for differences based on class A, class B, class C. So class is going to be the fixed factor the independent variable, then there are several options you have to select. We'll go to options and then check mark descriptives, estimates of effect size, homogeneity tests. Then let's go to post hoc right here and let's move class over to this right box. And this is something you'll have to verify with your committee as well. Everyone has a preference. Um, you have to choose a particular post hoc test. I tend to go with a two key comparison. So the, the whole purpose of this box is, okay, say we do find we have significance, we have differences by class. That's not quite enough information. We need to know this class A, defer from class B? Does class A defer from class C? And does class B defer from class C? There are three different combinations because we have three different classes. Um, so we're comparing every possible pair of classes. Okay, so class, two key test. You can also go to plots if you want kind of a, a visual representation and put class on the horizontal axis and do a bar chart for this. And that's pretty much it. All right, we'll click OK. And this is what an ANOVA output looks like. At the top, we can see how many participants fall into each class, how many students are in each class. We can see the average math scores for each class. And then we have our second most important assumption here, Levine's test. This is checking for homogeneity of variance. Um, so going back to statistics layered here, we checked for normality using a shapiro wilk test right here or a kamograph smirnov And then the last assumption here is homogeneity of variance, also called equality of variance. So, Similar logic here in that you don't want a significant finding. We need the p-values to be greater than 0 0.05 for this test, and they are, okay? So Levine's test is supported. We have homogeneity or equality of variance. And we scroll down, and this is probably the most important table here. This is telling us, do we have significant differences in math by class? And what you do is you look for your independent variable, which is right here, class, and we go across the row, and we report this F value, this P value, or significance level, and this partial A to squared. That is your effect size, essentially. The most important value here is the P value which is significant, meaning that because this is below 0 0.05, we do have evidence of a difference or a significant difference in math scores between class A, B, and C. We need to do a little more digging to figure out which classes were significantly different, and that is in the next table. So here's that post hoc two key comparison that I mentioned earlier. And this is going to compare math scores from each class to every other class. 
Okay, now if you see a star right here or an asterisk, that means that that pair of classes is significantly different. Um, you can also look at the p-value column here. So either if you have a star or if the p-value is below 0 0.05, then we have a significant difference between two classes, all right? So first let's look at class A. Class A in this little box here is being compared to class B, and then class A is compared to class C. Looking at class A to class B, let's go across the row, and we can see that the p-value is significant, 0 0.023. What it's doing is it's taking math scores for class A and subtracting class B math scores, and that's this value right here. Um, so because it's significant and because this value is positive, it means that class A scored significantly higher than class B on math. And we can verify that. We can see that it's 3.91 units higher. Class A scored about three to four units higher than class B. This is where you scroll back up to your descriptive statistics table and you double check that. Okay, so we can see class A was 85.01 and class B was 81.10. So that subtraction right there, about four units, three to four units, that is what is being captured right here. And we do have a significant difference between class A and B with class A scoring higher. Then let's look at the next comparison, class A to class C. Okay, so then we go across this row and we see that the p-value is 0.227. That is greater than the significance threshold of 0 0.05. Therefore, we don't have evidence of significant differences between class A and class C or math scores. Now, it looks like we have one additional comparison. So here you can see class B and class A that is the same comparison we already looked at. The p-value is 0 0.023. It's also 0 0.023 up here. It's just doing the opposite uh, subtraction. So you can see it's doing class B minus class A, which is why this value is exactly the same. It's just negative. Okay, so we don't need to report that one again. We need to look at class B and class C. That is the one comparison we have not looked at. So going across this class C row, we see that there's about a 6.2 point difference, and it is a significant difference. Okay, so class B minus class C is a negative number. That means that uh, class C must have scored higher. Let's double check that. Okay, so class B, right here, we're looking at B and C. Okay, so B was 81, class C was 87, meaning that class C scored significantly higher than class B. So that 87.32 is significantly greater than class B at 81.10. All right, so based on the pairwise comparisons, kind of just summarizing this, you first look at the test of between subjects, you go across class, we do have evidence of differences in math scores by class. So we need to figure out which class is significantly preferred. And that's when you look at this post hoc table. And we saw that class A was significantly, uh, significantly higher than class B. And then class C was significantly higher than class B. Those are the two significant pairs. And then at the very bottom, you'll see bar charts uh, for what we presented here. If you just double click this chart, this is not APA format right now, but all you need to do is change the color. So if you just click one of the bars and then just select gray, black, or you could choose white, but you would have to use a different color for the border. Um, so usually black and gray are the colors I use to keep the APA format. You don't need a title up here. You need a figure caption, and that's pretty much it. I would change this over here to say estimated marginal means for math scores, something like that. 
And then you have the updated figure, right? You can copy and paste that into your dissertation. That is an ANOVA. Okay. The other form of an ANOVA is done when you're running a longitudinal study. Okay. So if you have pretest, post-test, or some follow-up in the future, you're looking for differences over time. Uh, that's when you do a repeated measures ANOVA. So you need to have a match continuous variable. That just means the same participants are coming back for pretest and post-test and follow-up. Uh, and we're comparing two or more points in time. Okay. So to set up a repeated measures ANOVA, you need to have one match dependent variable that is measured at least two times. Now, this is similar to what we discussed with the t-test earlier. Um, if you just have a pre and a post, then you can just do a pair t-test. You don't need to do a repeated measures ANOVA necessarily, but if you have three points in time or more, um, then a repeated measures ANOVA is your best bet. Again, you can check for assumptions at the statistics layered website. So we do have data here to run a repeated measures of NOVA. Uh, remember, reading was collected at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year, and at the end of the year. Um, so we have three matched measurements for reading. Now, it's very important when you set this up that across one row, you have an individual's data for every measurement. So you could have demographics at the beginning, you have what class these individuals were in, and then across the same row, you need to have the pre, post, and follow-up. That's usually a tricky step for some students. So if you're setting up the survey, you need to have an ID to match the participants. Usually you can't use names of students um, unless IRB is okay with that. But if you have uh, if you have them enter a confidential number or use their email address potentially. Um, that's how you can set it up in a survey. All right, to run a repeated measures ANOVA, we will go to analyze, then general linear model, and repeated measures right here. So this menu, these, this looked a little complicated. I know it did to me when I first ran this, um, but it makes sense once you've done it a few times. So we'll go to analyze, general linear model, repeated measures like this. This is the first box that pops up. So first we have to give our within subjects factor a name. So the within subjects factor, all that means is, is there a difference over time? Okay, so what I do is I call this variable time. Then we include how many different measurements throughout that time period that we have. And we had three, we had a pre-test, post-test and follow-up. We'll click add. You don't have to give a measurement name here. It's not necessary. Uh, then we'll go to define. This is the next box that pops up. So you can see it's already set up three boxes for us or three entries. Um, so this is where we put in pre, post, and follow up right here. And that's it uh, for the initial setup. All right. Then we go to options. In the same options, descriptive stats, effect size, homogeneity tests. For this, I'll go to estimated marginal means, select both of these, and check mark this box here. We don't run post hoc tests here because we are not comparing groups. You only run post hoc if you're comparing your grouping factors. We remember we had class, class A, B, and C. We are not putting class into this analysis. We just want to see, is there a difference over time and reading scores? So we don't have a post hoc option to select here. It's actually blank. We can't even put anything. Um, and then that's it, okay? You can do plots again. You could do a, let's do a bar chart again. All right, and then go to okay. And it's very similar. There's just a little more information reported in a repeated measures ANOVA. 
So at the top, you can see reading pre, reading post, reading follow-up. The sample size is the same across, meaning all 150 students did the pre-post follow-up. You can see the scores right here. Then if you scroll down a bit, this is probably the most important table, tests of within subjects effects. Before it was between subject effects when we had class, but within subjects means over time, essentially. We have a difference over time in math. Uh, so you can look, you'll have to do some digging into assumptions for repeat and measures ANOVA because there are a few additional ones. But let's assume we're we're meeting the assumption of sphericity. Okay, so we would interpret this row right here, go all the way across, and we report this p value. Okay, so this p value here, 0 0.530, tells us do we have a significant difference in math over time between pre, post, and follow up? This value is not significant. Okay, so we don't have evidence of significant changes in math. Okay, and that's pretty much where you stop. You stop right there if you don't have significance. That's kind of the deal breaker right there. Um, and then we can kind of eyeball the tests, the, the scores up here, and we can see that there wasn't much of a change over time. It seems like students did really well at pre which might have caused an issue is that the, the pretest scores are already so high. So the intervention that was done during the year did not have much of an effect. Um, scores did increase at post-test, but then they went back down at the follow-up. Okay, so we can see how similar the scores are. This is why we did not see significant differences. Okay, so that's a repeated measures ANOVA. And to kind of look at the assumptions more, before I mentioned that if assumptions are not supported, you can run a non-parametric backup. So if you propose an ANOVA initially, we want to look at differences in a variable between groups and you check for assumptions like the assumption of normality and it is not supported and you have a low sample size, then you might have to shift to a non-parametric alternative. So the non-parametric for this is a kruskal wallis test, um, which is similar than an ANOVA, but it uses mean ranks as opposed to means. Um, so to run this, you go to analyze, non-parametric tests, legacy dialogues, and then K independent samples. So this is quite deep into the menus of SPSS. Uh, K independent samples is what we want here. And then you put in math up here, class would go down here. However, I don't have it set up yet. Class needs to be numeric. Uh, so really easy. This applies to a lot of analyses is you need to have just a, a numeric version of that variable. So if we just make class A, B, and C, one, two, and three, that is really all we need to do. Like that. And then we'll call it class recode. So one was A, two was B, three was C, like that. All right, then going back into the Pascal Wallace menu, so non-parametrics, legacy dialogues, K independent samples. All right, and then, you know, math up here and class down here. We need to define the lowest class and the highest class. So we click this box here. Lowest was a one, highest was a three, and that's it. And then make sure Kruskal Wallace is checkmarked here. And you can see that this uses mean ranks as opposed to means. And we do have a significant difference in math across the three classes, uh, which verifies and confirms what we found in the ANOVA. So, uh, you know, a Kruskal Wallace or any non parametric backup can be a good way to double check your findings. 
All right, so again, you propose an ANOVA, the assumptions are not supported, then you could run a Kruskal-Wallis test. If you propose to do a repeat of measures ANOVA, and then the assumptions are not supported, you can run a Friedman ANOVA as a non-parametric backup. Similar menus for this one, you go to analyze, non-parametric tests, legacy dialogues, and then K-related samples. The re related just means the same participants are coming back, right? And for this, you put in reading pre, post, follow-up over here. Make sure that Friedman is selected over here. Click OK. And this is going to tell us you know, it's going to assess for differences in reading over time. Okay, so those are non-parametric backups. All right, so in summary, first, you need to pinpoint your research question. Are you looking for differences over time? Are you looking for differences by groups? Maybe you're not looking for differences at all. Uh, maybe you're looking at associations or correlations or regressions. Um, so if you're looking for differences, first pinpoint, do you have three or more groups to compare? If you do, then you can run an ANOVA. If you're testing for differences over time, do you have three or more different time points to compare? Um, if you do, then you can do a repeated measures ANOVA. If you only have two groups or two points in time, pre-test, post-test, then just run t-tests. Don't run ANOVAs. It's way simpler to just do a t-test. So tests between treatment and control or males and females, you can just do an independent t-test. And then tests between pre and post, you can do a paired t-test as opposed to a repeated measures ANOVA. And then once your data is all set up, check the assumptions, uh, double check with your committee what assumptions they want you to check uh, because everybody has a preference. Um, and then you can use SPSS or Intellectus to analyze your data and present interpretations. All right, if we have any questions, you can type them into the chat box. We'll send everyone a copy of the PowerPoint and the recording. And I see Sierra put some hyperlinks in the chat box as well for scheduling consultations or checking out our free dissertation resources. Do we have any questions about ANOVAs, setting them up, checking for assumptions for an ANOVA? We also looked at, you know, two of the most common examples of ANOVAs. There are more complicated ones. You know, you have ANCOVAs, you have mixed models, um, and I, we've done webinars on those as well. You know, the idea behind a mixed model ANOVA is if you're looking for differences over time and by group. So hypothetically, you know, if your research question was, was there a significant difference in reading scores across the year and by class? That's when you can do a mixed model ANOVA because you have differences, you're, you're checking for differences throughout the year, three measurements, but you also want to know, did class play a factor? Okay, so to do that, you would go to analyze, general linear model and repeated measures, which is something we already used here uh, when we just did pre post follow up. So for the most part, it is set up how we need it. The only addition that we make is we put lasts down here as a between subjects factor. And just to show how this is kind of set up. Uh, so this is now going to give you reading pre for class ABC, reading post, class ABC, reading follow-up, class ABC. There are three things to interpret when you do a, a mixed model ANOVA. Okay, the first is, do we have a difference over time? Uh, pre, post, follow-up. The second thing is, do we have a difference by class? 
class A, B, C. And then the third is, do we have a difference with the combination of, excuse me, the combination of pre, post, and follow-up with class? Okay, so that's kind of a big one. Um, but the idea here is first you look at time. Do we have differences over time? We do not. Then we look at differences by group. We have differences based on class. Yes, we do. So class A, B, and C do defer. And then do we have differences based on the combination of time and class? So this is looking at pre, post, follow-up with class A, B, C. And we do have a significant difference there. So just wanted to illustrate that, you know, this is more a true experimental study. Um, if you're looking at differences over time after an intervention, based on treatment and control groupings. That is the true experimental study, uh, in which case usually a mixed model and no. All right, I don't see any questions. Do we have any questions uh, regarding ANOVAs? All right, well, if we don't have any questions, uh, we'll send everyone a copy of the PowerPoint and the webinar um, and come join us for the future webinars we're doing. Uh, we do one for every chapter of the dissertation. Uh, so if you're stuck on lit review now, come join us for a lit review webinar. If you're stuck on methods, come join us for a methods webinar. And uh, just let us know if we can be of any assistance. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.